Run for the Shore podcast. Welcome to episode 13 of Drum for the Song podcast. I am your host, Dane Campbell. I play drums in Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons. I'm super excited to introduce you to my guest today. It's Mickey D, who was the drummer in Motorhead since 1991 until they sadly ended in 2015. He then joined Scorpions in 2016 and that's who he's recording an album with at the moment. If you're a Motorhead or Scorpions fan, you absolutely must listen to this episode with Mickey. He talks about how having a musical family inspired him to take up the drums at an early age, and he also got to see Deep Purple live at the age of seven. How he turned down Lemmy to join Motorhead twice. Why playing a Scorpions gig is more demanding than a Motorhead show how he never enjoyed playing the song Going to Brazil live, why he's not fond of the Motorhead album Hammered, why Lemmy was sometimes difficult to work with in the studio, why Mickey left the band during the recording of Overnight Sensation. He's also got some insights on the new Scorpions album, why he uses three different weights of colour-coded Vincent sticks and how he sometimes combines them for certain songs. Why he doesn't like practice pads. He also talks about the ergonomics of his drum kit and why you should be looking at yours right now. I'm sure you'll enjoy this episode. Please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you're listening. Please leave a comment or leave a review if you're allowed to. Please check out my other episodes and please consider supporting me on Patreon for some extra bonus content. I've just teamed up with the guys at Cameron's Brewery and Motorhead Beer and they're going to be offering my Patreon patrons 20% off any online orders of beer but they're also donating a giveaway prize to coincide with every episode so make sure you're signed up to be in with a chance of winning that. You can sign up now at patreon.com forward slash drum for the song for a chance of winning those prizes and for a discount on the beer and for loads of other exciting extra content as well. Also, I'm really excited to announce that I've just launched my brand new website, which is drumforthesong.com. So there you can find out more about the podcast episodes and it's also where you'll find my brand new merchandise store. I'd love to hear your feedback about this episode on social media. If you're on Facebook, search Dane Campbell Drummer or join the Drum for the Song official Facebook group. If you're on Instagram or Twitter, you can find me at Dane underscore drums or at Drum for the Song. And now, for any of you TikTokers out there, I'm now on TikTok at Drum for the Song. Thanks for watching or listening. I really hope you will enjoy this fantastic conversation that I had with the awesome Mickey D. Drum for the Song podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Drum for the Song. My name is Dane Campbell, and today I'm very lucky to be here with Mickey D, uh, who was a massive influence to myself. So, hello, Mickey. How are you? Hey there. (laughs) Good to see you. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time today to have a little chat with me. Really appreciate it. And uh, how have you been? I'd be great, Dane. You know, we've been, uh, you know, even in these fucked up times, uh, we managed to uh, to do Australia and Asia here earlier this year. And uh, unfortunately, the summer went out, out you know, and, and uh, probably a few shows in the fall. But we've been working on the record now uh, since early fall. And uh, that was the plan to do a, a new great record. So I'm pretty much done with, with the drums. And this album we recorded exactly the same as we did with Motorhead's last record, you know, live. So oh, nice. I, I think it's going to be a great album. And uh, so we, we didn't have to cancel too much. But That's it's still, know. yeah, but it still sucks, though. You know what I mean? It's, it's horrible, all these. Uh, restrictions and you know you can't can't go and see any shows and you know i I just 
yeah, it's hopeless right now. Yeah, and um, what could you describe what it is like in Sweden? Because I believe they did things a little bit differently. Is that right? With the very, very different. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we we ha we do have quite a high death rate here compared to our Scandinavian neighbors. I mean, right. it's actually tremendously high compared to Norway, Finland, and Denmark. But I believe that we did the right thing because we kept our society very open. It still is if you compare to yeah, pretty much any country in the rest of Europe or the world, actually. And uh, I do agree with that, even if I was sick myself here in in March, March, April, we were pretty damn sick here, but influenza sick, if you will, you know? Right. I, I never been this sick, knock, knock on wood, before. But with that said, it, it still is an influenza. And the middle age, I mean, the average age of people, unfortunately, that pass away here is 82 years old, you know? And uh, people with underlying diseases and stuff, you know. But that kind of goes regular influenza as well. People die in thousands here in Sweden every year. Yeah. Of uh, of uh, so I tend to agree on the open society because it does more harm than good to shut it down. Yeah, as so long as the hospitals can can manage. Uh, take care of the, the really sick ones, you know, I think we should keep it as open as we can. And I, I believe every country should have that kind of vision, but th unfortunately they don't. So mm. enough about COVID. Um, but yeah, obviously my podcast is mainly a drumming podcast where I interview and speak to drummers. So I'd like to know how your drum journey started. I know you started playing when you were a young boy. I remember seeing the photo the view right. behind the sonar kit. So how yeah. did how did you start playing, and how did how did that progress to your professional career? Well, you know, it's I'm coming from kind of a little bit of a drum family. Uh, my cousin, my uncle, our oh, two cousins actually, and and my uncle, they all play drums. There was no guitar players, or <laughs> thank God for that. But uh, <laughs> bass players. <laughs> I hope your dad's listening to this. Uh, he probably won't listen. No, nah, maybe. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it was all drums. So of course I got very inspired by those guys. And they played in, uh, well, my uncle played in a kind of a jazz, jazzy band, you know, and uh, and then my cousins in, in rock bands and stuff. So uh, that's where the, the first inspiration came about. Uh, and I got to play on their drum kits and, you know, and, and right there, the interest of playing drums was born for sure. Uh, and then later on, of course, I, I kept it alive and, and uh, progressed myself. And I, I loved hard, hard rock. I mean, I was seven years old when I saw Deep Purple first time, you know. Wow. 19, 1971. So to me, that's what I wanted to play. I mean, it was a hobby. You know, I was going to be an athlete. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, drums were just like a hobby. I, I never thought I'd be a a drummer as a you know occupation. But uh, yeah, from there on it went, and uh, I believe over the years that I've been taking the right turn, if you will. A lot of people say, "Oh, you play with so many bands," but it's really not that many bands. Uh, there was a Swedish band here, kind of that took off a little bit and we played two three times a week at certain clubs and you know just small places and and that kind of put the the base for me and then from there on i moved to copenhagen and we started a band called geisha okay and uh through geisha i got king diamond and through king diamond uh we moved to us and and uh and through King Diamond, I actually met your dad and, and the boys in Motorhead first time, 1986, I believe. Hmm. I, I did I did meet Lemmy earlier than that, but, but we actually toured in Europe, 86, 87. And, 
And that's the first time I got offered the spot with Motorhead. Lemmy called me and said, look, you know, if I wanted to join Motorhead, because they did have a bit of problems with uh, with Filthy at that time. Yeah. And I turned them down, and I'm glad I did, because I did not really know what I was getting into. You know, I, I wanted to earn some more stripes on my shoulders. And we were great, doing great with King Diamond. And I had a big, big, uh, if you will, position in that band, you know. And when you're a young kid playing drums, you want to play as much as you can over yeah. as you know you want to be the rock star on, on drums you know and do technical shit and you know just so it fit me perfect at that time and uh yeah eventually i left king diamond and i joined dokken got offered to play with dawn and that was perfect coming from playing very technically and i felt very narrow as a drummer I felt that I couldn't really sit and rock out. Mm. Uh, just play all these technical shit and backbeats. And, you know, I was very stressed in, in, in my soul with how I was playing. And yes, it was a great stuff we created, but I had a hard time just sitting, playing, rock out to a riff, you know. And my meter wasn't that good. And so when Don... I hooked up with Don. It was just the perfect type of music to move into. Simple West Coast, California rock and roll, you know, mm. almost almost a little poppy at times, you know. So, uh, but after a few years with Don and talking to to Motorhead guys, I actually turned Lemmy down one more time there. When <laughs> he called me, I think just a few weeks before we were supposed to get out there and do a 12 month tour. I said, Lem, you know, I can't just leave now. I felt more ready at that time to tell you the truth, but we did a whole year touring with Dawn and, and that was great. That was a great school for me. And, and we were great friends and had a lot of fun together. So, uh, but after a few years with Dawn, I felt that, look, I belong in the heavy heavy division and uh motorhead was just absolutely perfect yeah and unfortunately we had so many years together so much fun uh that was the yeah the highlight of 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 my life really you know when it comes to everything happened all these years you know my family the boys getting born, you know, we had so much fun together. Phil, me, Lemmy, and Versal in the beginning. And, and uh, yeah, it was great. And unfortunately, with them, Lem passed then five years ago now. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get a quick call from the Scorps, you know, and to join yet another fantastic old classic band, you know where I feel myself that I, I do make a difference. You know, I, I feel that I kicked their ass and, and they actually kicked my ass too. You know, these guys are amazing on stage. They, Rudolf and Klaus are 72 years old and they wow. run around like they like 35, 40 years old, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's a, and Matthias is 65, I think. And he's like a teenager, you know what I mean? It's great. i I feel that I fit in and I make a difference in the band, you know, so. Yeah, I think, I think um, from here, I saw you live once with the Scorpions and I thought it brought a lot of energy to the yeah. band, even though they, like you said, they were running around, they had energy themselves, but I think you brought more power to the music. I wanted to bring the heaviness to it, you know. Uh, actually to bring a little bit of motorhead into Scorpions and, mm. and it felt like they really wanted that themselves. Nice. They, they don't want to be a super heavy, heavy band. That's not what they want, but they, they do want the backbone a little heavier. And I felt that and, and it just fit, fit perfect for me and Pavel to go really, really heavy behind these guys, you know, 
because the mel it's very melodic music and and they have so many great hits and it's a little bit different thinking of course than playing with motorhead you know where when phil doing a solo i actually have to be a little bit more busy on kick drums and you know to to me and lemmy filling up the the space and uh, the same thing now with scorpions it's actually the opposite you know i have to when stuff is happening on stage i have less is much more you know so but you can still be very heavy you play quarter notes on the high end instead of eight notes you you rock out on on a ride with quarter notes you do heavier drum fills and you know and that and you i hit harder yeah so so all that is taking that into the soup of scorpions uh, i believe it works out pretty good you know yeah no that's great to hear and um i was actually going to ask what the main differences were between playing with motorhead and the scorpions in terms of like you said pacing yourself for the set list i guess there's a little bit more energy and tempo up tempo songs with motorhead compared to scorpions is that correct so yeah a lot of people say hey listen make you you're probably sleeping through the set and i'm telling you this is so much more demanding than motorhead ever was physically really? okay because you know as you know if i was starting to lose my breath here and there with motorhead i could just shout at your dad or let me go hey listen hang on boys have a drink and all oh, right is that what you did <laughs> pre pretend to tune up the snare a little bit or, or, <laughs> and let me and phil was they were not very uh hard to uh to to you know to get a break they they went around the stacks and and took a drink and we said cheers and you could even actually have a chat on stage for a while you know nice but with with the scorpions it's it's all on a click track because of our screens ah right the production uh and i do play around the click but at least we have a it has to work with the lyrics and stuff on, on the screens and all what's going on in the production which we never had with motorhead no so every show is exactly the same length on on the fucking second or minute you know so even the, Not, the gaps between the songs is exactly the same pretty much uh, yeah. klaus cues right whatever he says then the so we're talking it could be one one or two minutes difference between the sets on two and a half hour sets so you know it's uh it's very demanding i i i play a part it, it goes up and down this set and uh there's a part in the set after we've done the acoustic medley and then we come up and do wind of change i'm actually freezing on stage and then it's about 40 minutes 45 minutes of non-stop we do heavy heavy songs and the drum solo straight into blackout straight into big city nights i mean there's 45 minutes where i don't even have a chance to change drumsticks you know what i mean wow so that is very very demanding for me so but it's great it's a challenge and i love it the, the more tired i get on stage the better i play you know so yeah i understand that plus like you said two and a half hours that would be much longer than the motorhead, set, motorhead. especially yes. towards the end i guess we yeah we, we usually did 90 minutes with yeah. motorhead you know uh and when we played with other bands it could be 60 or 70 minutes but but motorhead was we we control the set yeah yourselves ourselves probably. yeah and uh here and there phil ran outside and you know changed his guitar and guitar took a piss or <laughs> you know or, or lemmy disappeared off stage and no one knew what he was doing you know, <laughs> you know we, we 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 could uh we could run it ourselves more in a different way. No, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, yeah. So I was going to ask about, with regards to Motorhead, are there any of the songs that you miss playing the most? Like three songs, maybe that you miss playing. Oh man, there's 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 so many songs I miss playing with Motorhead. 
pretty much every single song except Metropolis. Oh, sorry, <laughs> you're going to Brazil. You don't like going to Brazil. That's Brazil. that's one of the songs. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I like going to Brazil, but I try to get rid of that song since day one. What What are the reasons for that? I think it was. I don't know. It was just. I don't know. I just had something against that song, and also <laughs> Catch Scratch Fever. Oh yeah. And and Phil and Lemmy, Phil and Lemmy used to tease me. They used to uh, start Catch Scratch Fever as a sound check song, you know, and, and they knew I hated it. <laughs> That's quite funny because obviously I, the, I really hated that fucking. The 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 band with um, my dad, Phil Campbell, and the Bastard Sons. At the very start, we used to play Cat Scratch Fever. And I didn't used to like playing it. I didn't enjoy it. And uh, yeah, no, maybe maybe that was why. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just cert certain songs you're never, ever, ever going to uh, enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, going to Brazil, going to Brazil is a good song. It's just that I had something against it since then, day one, for some reason. And, but back to your question, I mean, yeah. I, I miss playing every song that we did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Overkill as the last song. I mean, you know, if we did not have the audience on a whole show for some weird reason, it didn't happen very often. But once in a while, we, we had a kind of a more dodgy set. But once we started Overkill, that was it, you know. It just exploded at that point, you know. Yeah, I think that song is. And we so did powerful. Overkill three years with. We did Overkill with with Scorpions, you know, for three years. So. Yeah, I saw it. Didn't you have like a little hey, Lemmy, dad? Lemmy tribute and and stuff like that on the, on yeah, the video? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. That's really nice. Um, Phil played with us in Barcelona there. Yeah, that was he the, came on stage and did Overkill with us. So. Yeah, that was the that was when I was. That was there. great. Yeah, that was a great day. Yeah. I remember it fondly. I think mm -hmm. I, had, I drank too much beer, which is rare for me because I don't drink a lot of beer. Yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a good day, but um, okay, that's yeah, yeah, it was great fun. But um, so you, me. are you probably not going to play Overkill going forward then? No, we took it out now. We thought it, you know, it, we thought that it was great that everyone wants to play it, but yeah. we we uh, we actually I thought it was enough, you know. Yeah, it was a great tribute to to Lemmy and to to ourselves and Motorhead and. But you know, three years is cool. I I thought we should put in a uh, another Scorpion song instead. You know, we yeah. we're not there to do covers. No, no. but uh, it was to pay the respect. And if you ask the guys, I already know. I know that they they would love to keep playing it. It was more me saying that. I think it's enough now. You know, it's it's cool. Yeah, fair enough. We don't want to want to overdo it. You know. Yeah, no problem. And with regards to all the many Motorhead albums you played on and obviously co-wrote. Is there one particular album you're more proud of or did you have a favorite album? Well, there's a few, actually. I, I think every record we did is top-notch. I agree. Except, Ooh. except Hammered. Oh, that's one of my favorites. That's strange. Really? Yeah, I, I don't know why that is. I think maybe because it was, I don't know, maybe it was the period of my life when it came out is when I used to come out was to the shows. And I was just going to say that. I Maybe was that was why. That. So I That's have a, why. a good memory of that time of my life. And um, right. But I remember the songs, yeah, Walk a Crooked Mile. I, I loved mm -hmm. that. And I guess it was a little bit progressive in a, in a now small there's, way. There's, there's, there's a few songs that are fantastic on that record. Yeah. But then there is, unfortunately, a few fillers as well. Right. And why I say that I, I don't think it's one of our better ones is because we had, that's the only record where we were pressed for time. Ah, okay, right. We should have had a few more weeks to work some more songs out. But I remember why, I don't really remember why we were so pressed for time and we were not really ready. And then we had Tom Penancio uh, producing it. Yeah, and he's a great producer, but I thought he kind of was a little bit too intimidated by by Lemmy, you know. Oh, okay. And 
you cannot be that. You have to, you have to stand up against Lemmy because Lemmy had a tendency sometimes to be quite lazy in the studio. Okay. If he if he wrote the melody for a song, and we listened to it, and I said, "Hey, Lem, you know, you can do better than that." Ah, oh, no, I know. This is fucking great. This is good. And I told whoever produced the record, I said, "Look, this is not a good melody for this song." No, I know, I know. He, and once you convince Lemmy to go back home and write a different melody. If you could manage to to do that two or three times, he came up with brilliant stuff. Right. But he he had a tendency of singing the guitar riff a little too much. I see what you mean. Rather than come yeah. up with something unique and new. Exactly. And mm. uh, Tom Penancio, he never really fought with Lemmy. I remember I was back in Sweden when Lemmy was singing, and they sent me the songs he did, and I go, "Are you serious? I mean, he's singing the fucking guitar riff." Yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to tell him to change. I don't like it either. And then one month later, it was the same fucking melody. I said, why? You didn't tell them? Mm. And he didn't. Okay. Oh, let me say, uh, he liked it, so I kind of backed off. And said, why? You know, you have to be on his ass about these things. And that's why Camera Webb works so great with us. And, and, uh, and Howard Howard Benson in the beginning because they they were tough enough to stand up against Lemmy, you know. That's when Lemmy came in the studio, I started screaming and yelling that he thought he was great, and everybody just to sh- shut up, really, you know. And <laughs> that was what he wanted. Mm. It was me, me and Phil. They had to fight with him, not fight, but we had to argue with him. Yeah. We needed help with a producer to to uh, stand up. And, and that's why I think that record kind of... And it was right after 9-11, too. So the, the atmosphere in California was really bad. Oh, know? right, yeah, yeah. I can imagine, yeah. You were, walked in to get a six-pack of beer and people staring at you and everyone was suspicious about everyone. And I just didn't think it was a very comfortable time. Okay. So overall, I think some of the songs are fantastic on that record, but some of them are absolutely the worst shit we ever done. <laughs> <in this. laughs> I'll have to go back and listen, and maybe maybe I'll figure out the the filler songs. Like which I, it's ones? Been many, it's been many years before I. Yeah. Many years since I listened to it, but I have fond memories. Some of my yeah, favorites. And, are, and are, just the time, just the time pressure we were on i remember i mean me and phil we wanted to write some more stuff and we just had no time for it you know they said no you guys got a good track now and you know oh but other than that i think wow every record with cameron webb was fantastic uh one of my favorites are are actually uh what's it called again the first one he did um uh, uh, did he do Inferno or was that? Yeah, Inferno was oh. the first one. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that's one of the best ones for sure. Yeah, and, great. Uh, I'm, I mean, I like Bastards and and Sacrifice and and Overnight Sensation is is a very good album. But at that time, we we had that was the toughest time of the period with me in the band because Lemmy got fairly soft on the <laughs> record. Me and Phil, we were looking at each other. He wanted to have acoustic guitar and, and the melodies were almost fucking pop melodies. And, and we go, what the hell is this? You know? <laughs> and, and we were arguing a lot at the mix. I, I believe I left the band two, three times on that, <laughs> that period. And, really? and I, think, I think your dad did the same thing. We said, fuck it, you know, <laughs> let me... You can do this fucking record yourself. We don't give a shit anymore, you know. <laughs> it was it was a tough time. Oh, see, I, I but, don't I don't know any of these stories, so really, well, no, I don't think you, so. Ask your father about yeah. it because he, it, we we did argue a lot, and I I remember Phil leaving the studio every other day, just took off, and <laughs> and so did I. I was actually on my way to the airport at one point when. Todd, our manager, called and said, look, you've got to go back, Mickey. I said, 
Tom, you don't understand. I don't give a shit anymore. You know, let me do this record himself, you know. Because he was very, very hard to work with on that particular record. He wanted it his way and his way alone. And that's now not how we were working, you know. Yeah. We were uh, a three-piece band that everyone had the equal say. And I knew that Lemmy, he wanted that more than anyone else. Yeah, and suddenly he walked away from his own, his own uh, idea, you know. So which and I album, asked him, which what? which album are you specifically talking about now? Overnight sensation. Right, right, okay, yeah. And and I actually asked Lemmy. I said, "Look, Lem, I mean, what are you doing here? You know, what the hell are you doing? Uh, this is not your record, you know. This is our record." And he he always he was the guy that stood up for equal rights and Lemmy was a fair man you know he was great you know and I I respected him tremendously for standing up for both me and Phil and yeah. and he did not want to know about Lemmy 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 you know and and uh, and then he walked away from his own structure or idea and I said I don't know how to deal with you Lem now because you. you I don't know what you're doing, you know. Uh, some of the stuff he came and wanted to change was became ridiculous. It sounded like a fucking schlager band, you know. And 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 I said, you can do your own record, you know, if you want. With this shit, we we gotta write a motorhead record here, you know, not some soft fucking melodic fucking pie of shit, you know. It's like. <laughs> So um, that was the huge argument at that time. Wow. But yeah. but he, he straightened out pretty quick and, and we all became happy again, you know. Ah, so. Good, good. Well the album I think that album is one of the, the other good ones from that period with right. some great, great you know, good singles, good stand up songs on there. So Yes, it was it was uh it was a very melodic record. Yeah. Which a I lot think... of the songs are, are played on radio and uh and that's kind of what became of that record but to make it more soft it, it would not have been a good one you know no no, i agree i agree i think a lot of the fans may have been more disappointed if there were too many soft songs i think you can yes. get away with one ballad maybe and then yeah not just ballads but even uh, like the song overnight sensation it's it's a melodic song you yeah. know the chorus is very melodic and uh and there's nothing wrong with that but behind the melody needs to be heaviness you know yeah power it still yeah. has to sound motorhead mm -hmm. and and that's kind of where we where we had different opinions at at that time okay he wanted he wanted even more acoustic guitar on it with no electric guitars and mm. uh, yeah we we were arguing a lot about that stuff yeah that, that is a bit strange yeah oh well interesting thanks for sharing yeah. that with us so, yeah yeah You've 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 mentioned you were recording the new Scorpions album, and so you recorded you recorded it live, or did you jam yes. it live? And how did the yes. song how does the songwriting differ from when you were doing Motorhead albums? Do you write? Well, I hear room? here here the record. Oh, most of the songs here has been written by Rudolph and Klaus, right? And some of Matthias stuff. But in the studio now, we've been changing quite a bit, you know. So I don't feel like I'm actually writing the songs with them, but I definitely made a lot of changes. Right. Okay. Uh, with with the guys and all four of us are playing live in cool. the studio. It's a big, big room, and uh, we all have our separate station. And uh, Klaus have have uh, sang some scratch vocal on all these songs and. Uh, so we could cue on stuff and see what what actually the song is all about. Yeah, that helps. But the actual yeah, but the actual <laughs> music is is played live, and I I have no idea if Scorpions ever did a record like this. Maybe in the seventies. So wow, it's it's a heavier record. It's actually uh, it's going to be taking a lot of people for surprise. You know, they're going to be surprised over that it's 
it's um it's a very wide album. It's gonna be classic Scorpion stuff, and it's gonna be almost songs back to the seventies. And you know, it's it's I'm really looking forward to to uh, listen to this as a finished record. Yeah, me too. Is it probably gonna be released next year? I imagine. Yeah, we hope hopefully yeah. in the spring. You know. Great. Yeah. Amazing. That's that's so. so cool. I've been going back and forth to Germany now the whole fall here. Yeah. And I know the boys are working uh, every day on it as we speak. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm sure it'll be great. Sol yeah, solos. And Klaus been singing, you know, doing his proper vocal on it. And, and of course, there's little, little fixes here and there on, on maybe a rhythm guitar or some bass notes or yeah. even I, I fixed a few things on the drums after the live recordings, but, but, uh, 95% is, is, is live, you know? Amazing. That's so cool. So, uh, so it's, it's good. Yeah. I seen, I saw some of your video clips on Instagram. So if anyone right. who's listening, follow Mickey D on Instagram, there's some, uh, videos from the recording sessions and you show off some of your drum kit. So, Let's talk a little bit about what equipment you're using nowadays. You've been with Sona Drums since my whole life. Your whole life. That's fantastic. But, but I, I've been endorsed by Sonar since early '80s. Cool. And I stuck with these guys. And uh, then apply the same with Paiste Symbols as the T-shirt you're wearing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and I've been so happy with these guys. They, they just stood behind me and and when i actually left king diamond 1988 paiste and sonar were the first ones to call me saying mickey don't worry about the endorses we are behind you you know wow and that i'm never going to forget that because that is uh, we don't even have a written contract between each other it's, oh, wow. it's amazing we have a handshake in the early 80s. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so that is very, very respectful, you know, and I, I love those guys. And uh, and then DW, same same thing there. I've been endorsed by those guys since the 80s as well. Yeah. And they make great pedals for me. Of course, they want me to play their drums, but but they know I've been sticking to sonar for so long. And Yeah. But I love DW drums as well, you know, I... I've been recording on them and I, uh, before, and I, I've been jamming on them and rehearsing on them, and it's great drums. Uh, but as of, I've been sticking to the pedals since the '80s, and uh, and uh, then uh, Vincent Drumsticks, yep, Brilliant. which I I was a part of for a long time, a part owner of that company. I'm not anymore. Okay, I didn't know I, that. Yeah, no, uh, but I'm still playing the drumsticks, which is, uh, I think, is the best drumsticks in the world, you know. I agree. Yeah, you play them yourself, I, right? I, I play them myself. I, I remember you, I think you managed to... I got you some pairs once, yeah. And I just realized, wow, these are lasting me so long. Compared yeah. Compared to all the other brands I used to use. And I still, yeah, I still use them. I use the 5B model. And I, right. I, I, did, I did an experiment on tour with the bastard sons i did 16 shows with the same sticks the same really day. they were they were completely worn down but they didn't yeah, break. Yeah. they didn't actually snap yeah yeah no they Amazing. don't they really don't and yeah. uh, but five bees i eat chinese food with that stuff. i know i know <laughs> <laughs> what are, you, are yours like more of a 2b you've got a signature yeah, mine, model right yeah mine is about a 2b nice and then i as you know i have a different weight in the sticks Right. Okay. I don't know. I, I I have three different on on the butt on the stick. There's there used to be a motorhead skull. Yeah. Now I have a scorpion. Nice. But they are they are in different colors. So the black motorhead stamp or scorpion, that's the front heavy stick. Right. Okay. And the green one is a medium, and the red one is very uh, the weights more in your hand. Ah, okay. So, for instance, when I played a song like Sacrifice, I have a red right stick and a green left stick. Oh, I didn't know that's amazing. And when I played before. Metropolis, 
with a lot of quarter notes on a bell, I have a black right stick and a green left stick. <sighs> so uh, I, I have them in my stick bag, different feel and weight on every stick for different songs. For different songs, yeah. If I did a lot of tingling shit, as I call it, <laughs> then obviously I choose the red stick, a red, yeah. the lighter one. And if there was a, a yeah, like a Metropolis, could be two black sticks, you know, or a black right one and a green snare stick, you know. I had no idea. That's such a, it makes yeah. sense. It makes so much sense if you're playing songs with completely different feels and te tempos. To I, do that. I believe Ian Paste is another guy that kind of works a little bit with that. Okay. Be because I used to sit and weigh every stick. I mean, the stick in itself weighs the same. Yeah, right. Okay. It weighs 62 grams. <laughs> and then where the weight is distributed in the stick, that's where I... So I used to, if I had 1,000 drumsticks in a box, I went through 1,000 sticks and put light, medium, heavy, light, medium, heavy. And then we used to, to do with a Sharpie right. uh, a color. But then later I, I had a motorhead stamp so I can see what stick I was using where. And when we played a... a just because you got the power. That's two black sticks. Very, yeah. very heavy. Yeah. And when I played Overkill, I had two green sticks, you know. Uh, well, so, yeah. I never knew that. So was that something you did after you received them from Vincent? Or your drum tech stamped them for you? Or, or, or did they no, do I, for you? I, I started something with Vincent called weight control. Right. Because when I was with Vic Firth for over 20 years, they were great also, don't get me wrong. I love Vic Firth. But if I got a box of 1,000 pairs or 500 pairs, I went through every single drumstick and they were all in different weights. Yeah. So out of 500,000 sticks, maybe I had to get rid of 200 that I, even, I couldn't even play them. Because they were either too light or too heavy. Yeah. So I was getting tired of that, and I, I wanted to do something called weight control. So if I have, if I send two green ones or a green stick to, to Vincent, I wanted 250 pairs of green ones, 500 pairs of red ones, and 400 pairs of black ones, you know? Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. And you still do that now with the Scorpions? Every yeah. single day. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. so cool, man. I really yeah. didn't know that. Run for the Shore podcast. Hi, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Drum for the Song. I just wanted to briefly interrupt the interview to tell you about my Patreon page, which is a place where you can support the podcast and, of course, support myself. You can um, sign up to one of the three tiers on there. There's one that's £3 a month, one that is £5 a month, and one that is £10 a month. There are loads and loads of exclusive benefits to signing up, including bonus episodes, merch discounts, Christmas card for myself. Um, if you sign up to the top tier, I'll send you a pair of my drumsticks. Um, loads of other stuff, so go check it out. It's patreon.com forward slash drum for the song and um, another way you could support me if you're interested if you're not bothered about the patreon thing if you go to my official website drumforthesong.com you can send a donation via paypal so um yeah thanks for watching this and enjoy the rest of the show drum for the song podcast so um i remember watching you backstage doing your warm-ups on the back of a chair with a towel over it right is there anything in particular you would recommend that drummers do to literally warm themselves up to prevent injuries or to play faster or or more accurately? well I, I i believe i i don't like these practice pads they don't feel good to me at all i used to fold a towel and put it on on a on a table yeah like two or three folds on 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 a on a towel and either back of a chair 
or on a on a wood or glass table. That's where the where the right feel is for me. Yeah, and uh, I can't say that I'm one of these guys that sit and warm up a lot because I don't. Uh, I've been doing it more lately. Mm. When you grow a little older, it feels good to to be a little bit better warmed up, for sure. But yeah. uh, I know other drummers they can sit for one or two hours and just fucking do paradiddles and triples and you know and and that's just not me somehow i don't i never had to do that but what's more important is that i've been working with the angles on my drums much much more than people should really drummers should really 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 work on their angles yeah so what i've been doing if you're going to do 150 to 200 shows every year it's very important that you play right. And what I mean with that is that, for instance, my snare is very straight. So when I hit a rim shot, I have a straight line, not, yeah. you know, bended. Same thing goes with my toms. The most power you get is hitting from above, not from within. Uh, so you get this special, almost like a whip whipping yep. effect makes sense and and it forced my shoulders to sit up straight i have a straight back i don't sit like a fucking cheese doodle you know what i mean no yeah hunchback not to die exactly <laughs> and mean. and and symbols are very far away so i have to really stretch to reach them you know yeah and and that has saved me from carpet tunnel and you know uh you know, it's like people work in an office. If they do computer or they write with a pen too much and they sit in a wrong angle, you are going to get inflamed and you are going to get trouble after so many years, you know. So the angles for me has been extremely important. And where the hi-hat is, I mean, if you change the hi-hat one centimeter too high or too low, immediately I, I feel it over my shoulder. Yeah, and I I can't. Sometimes it can hurt so bad I can't even open a door. You know, I can't even lift my arm. Wow! So it's been extremely important for me to keep my kit at perfect angles. Because some drummers come up and say, "How can you fucking play on your toms? Yeah, sitting so straight." And I always well, thought it was difficult when I used to play your kit. It is. <laughs> but I, difficult. I guess I was I was I guess I was maybe smaller then. Maybe it'd yeah. be different now. But um I always thought they were very high and very high I, up. I, I had to like hit them like that. But um yeah, maybe it'd be it, different now. It, it it's important if you think about how you hit your tom then. Yeah. Your your shoulders are up, your neck is straight, your back is straight, and you you have to come from above. Yeah. Some drummers, they tilt them too much. And the the power is not going to be the same if you play from your, your upper body and out, you know. That makes it sense, has yeah. to come from, from on top of you. Yeah. And uh, then you don't need to use so much muscle power or it's more of a dynamic whip somehow. Mm. And you get this particular snap into your hit. And uh, and that that has been uh, very important for me, and and I believe that's why I so far knock knock on wood, but has not dealt with with too much of of problems with shoulders, elbows, wrists. You yeah, know. yeah. I've, but I'm, of course, after two and a half hours with Scorpions and touring a whole year, I can feel it in my body yeah. for sure. You know, and I, I imagine it's getting harder. As, as time goes on so yeah it's a good tip it is important for people to look at those things the ergonomics of their drum set the drum kit and um yeah warm up a little. yeah at, at early age at yeah. early age yeah get you get used to a drum kit that makes sense you know yeah and i used to say you know drums is not supposed to be comfortable you're supposed to suffer back yeah. there you know yeah <laughs> You see drummers, they hit the snare drum and then the, 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 the arm rests on your thigh, you know, bam. And the arm, you know, what the fuck is that? <laughs> After a full concert, they have a sweat drop 
in their eyebrow, you know, go, okay, that's it. Mm. I mean, I play first two, three minutes on a set and I'm soaking wet, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely exhausted, you know, after just a few, uh, few songs, you know, and drums is a hitting instrument. Mm. They sound best if you hit them hard. Of course, you got to keep your dynamics in your way of playing. Yeah. But I believe it's a hitting instruments and you should hit them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's not a... cook soup, as I used to say, <laughs> minestrone soup on a drum kit. <laughs> so I was, I was going to say, I... I was going to ask, um, do you feel like you have to play? Like, I guess you mentioned about asking for a little break uh, in Motorhead, but do you think it's like a marathon? Like, oops, pla- sorry, cut off a little bit then. Would you agree that playing a set, especially a two yeah. and a half hour set, is a little bit like planning a marathon with regards to your energy? Um, does that make yes. any sense? And um, do you do any preparation before yes. before That's... a tour? Like if you if you haven't been on tour for a few months, do you do any cardio or anything like that before? Yeah, hi to Dane, Dane Campbell. Here comes Marcus. Hey, Marcus. Hey, Very good, man. Nice to see you. He says hi. It's been a long time. He's a big dude. I've He's seen, a big dude now. I've seen some videos of him on, on Instagram as well. So the good, good musicians, yeah, both, both the boys. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah fantastic. No, did, what did you say? You, you said... Um, did you do any form of like... What card? was your question again? With regards oh. to planning a set, like I guess like a marathon, two and a half hours, do you have to do any like cardio exercises before a tour? To get yourself prepared. Yes, I, I'm, I'm. I love sports, as you probably already know. I play, I play in the academy of of Gothenburg Hockey Academy team oh, wow. here. I play hockey two or three times a week. Oh wow! Ice hockey, and when I'm working out, I I, I have a personal trainer, uh, two times a week, sometimes three times a week. So right. pretty much four to five days. When wow. I'm when I'm active, you know, really, I've been I haven't been working out much lately, and the hockey is shut down because yeah. of COVID uh, for the last couple of weeks. But uh, that's kind of what keeps me physical. The 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 cardio is the hockey, and and then working out yeah. is is just keeping me nice. fairly fit, you know. That makes sense. Great. Um... Before we wind down now, then I've got two questions. I've got a Patreon page. Uh, people support me on there. So if you don't mind answering two questions um, that they've given right. me to ask you. One is from Rudy Pauli, who's a drummer in Germany. And he wants to know, are there any exercises or rudiments that you practice a lot in your early years? Or if you could remend, recommend anything important that young drummers should practice to improve their drumming skill set? That's a big question because I think it's very individual. Yeah. Uh, how to practice? I I like double strokes yeah. and triple strokes uh, and single strokes, of course. Just the most basic stuff. Uh, once you get rid of some of the coordination problems, uh, it will help you to to get way more dynamic in your playing, you know, but that's, that's common sense. That's what every, I cannot actually say a particular technique. It's, it's basically just to work. I remember when I started playing double bass drum, what I did is I, I got rid of my right bass drum and only played left one oh, for right. six months at least. Wow. So I played everything on my left foot, you know, and it, it was like starting over. Yeah, I can <laughs> imagine. Yeah. <laughs> it was so it sucked ass you know uh, but that was a good thing i remember yeah and then working a lot with double bass drum and tom fills together not just bass drum smashing away and not just single tom rolls but to interact tom and kick drums even snare drum of course with your kicks and that i've been working quite a lot with and with King Diamond, that's basically a lot of drum fills are 
combinations of kicks and snare kicks and 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 toms you know yeah no, that makes sense. Uh, that yeah that's that's kind of the advice i can give it's basically what what kind of drummer do you want to be i mean i did not go in because we didn't have internet when i was young uh, but i did not sit and learn from a book if you will i i, I came up with stuff myself right and then i i practiced that and that kind of led me into my own style hmm. because it's not so important to know a million things and have million chops if you sound like everybody else, you know? Yeah, no, I it, agree. It's important, it's important for young kids to, to think less is actually more, you know? And it's way better to, to become your own drumming style. I mean, I was so, in, you know, I just loved Ian Pace. And Brian Downey in Thilis yeah. and Deep Purple, you know, and Neil Peart in Rush. And when I grew up, I still do, by the yeah. way, but I almost copied Ian Pace and Brian Downey, especially. And a lot of, when I was young, I got a lot of small gigs going, well, call Mickey. He sounds exactly like Ian. Call Mickey. He sounds exactly like Brian. Mm -hmm. Call Mickey. He sounds like Neil Peart, you know. And it hit me. I'm just a bad copy of my idols, you know? So I was very, I got scared and woke up and go, gee, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta do my own shit here, you know? And that's what, when I started with these combinations, but uh, that's the best advice I can give this guy, Rudy. No, thanks very much. I'm sure he will appreciate that. Um, the next one is from Gareth Richards in Wales. You may have met Gareth. I don't know, he's a motorhead banger. Okay. What, what is your most memorable Motorhead show and why? Oh my God. <laughs> Where'd you start? We, you, you know, we almost did 5,000 shows together. 5,000? 5, 5, wow. 4,700 and something. It, it's crazy. That is crazy. Wow. That is crazy. So, obviously, you to the motor banger, the crazy motor banger. <laughs> it's imp it's impossible to say, but the most memorable one is probably the worst show we ever did together, and that was at Bloodstock, two thousand eleven. Bloodstock, interesting. Why why was it so bad? Oh my god, it was absolutely <laughs> horrendous, and it was so great to come back with Scorpions last year, and and do Bloodstock, and we did a kick ass concert and i even said at the press conference i said uh i can only apologize for what we did i believe it was 2011 it was horrendous and uh <laughs> can you explain why was it so bad then i believe ask your father i think okay. karang karang gave us a k that was crossed over you know? <laughs> i've never seen that and before and it said, I believe, in the in the review, if Motorhead played the same song at any time, it was actually not too bad. <laughs> what? Oh my God! Oh, I have to find was, that. No, what happened? Long story short, but what happened was actually Lemmy was sick. Right. Okay. He had a absolute normal cold, nothing dangerous, but he was sick as a dog. Yeah. He had fever. He could barely speak. He was in a shitty fucking mood. And I told him in the car going from London, me and Lemmy were in, this, uh, in the same car going, uh, going up there. I said, Lemmy, we have to cancel. You cannot do this show. And he insisted doing this show. Mm. So mm. we went on stage. And within one song, I believe, he turned around and said, Mickey, you motherfucker, you are killing me. Slow the fuck down. All oh, right. And I played every song slower than I ever done because of Lemmy. And I recorded every song, by the way, oh. from the mixing table because they, he had no concept on tempo sometimes, you know. Yeah. He was really angry at me. And when we came to Metropolis, he came behind his stacks and came up to me after Metropolis. I, I believe Phil was changing a guitar or something. 
And he screamed on top of his lungs that I was killing him. And I had a, I had a bucket of ice where I had a towel in. And I took the towel and I fucking threw it right in his face with ice and everything. <laughs> and told him to fuck off. And I left stage. I went to the dressing room. This was 200 meters away. And I kicked in my door, took my clothing, and went out to my, my car and said for him to take me to London. <laughs> and I said, and Phil and Lemmy continued playing, ch uh, changed his better, uh, uh, Chase is better than the catch. They start playing the next song and they didn't even hear that I was not behind the drums. <laughs> so, what, so what happened then? Did your drum tech fill in or, or did they just? Eddie came running and said, Mickey, just finish the show. Okay. And I walked on stage. And we finished the show, but it was horrendous. Mm. It was terrible. And I was throwing drumsticks at Lemmy. I was throwing towels. He was yelling at me throughout the show. <laughs> and, you know, it, and it was just terrible. Was that, that was a head, you, headline slot as well, was it? Yes. Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, at yeah. very, very important bloodstock ask yeah. your father about that. i will i definitely will i'm going to see if i can find any footage on youtube I, I, I believe i believe that phil saved the the or framed the actual kerrang review oh, right. because okay. uh he told me that he saved it and it was the worst ever <laughs> it said something like if the band at any point managed to play the same song at the same time it wasn't actually too bad but the rest <laughs> Oh my God! It, it it got better towards the end of the set. It, I agree. I mean, the the last third of the set was kind of a normal set, okay. but the, at least first half was absolutely appalling. So, unfortunately, that is the most memorable of the shit ones <laughs> because we had so many good ones, you know. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, I'd say out of a thousand shows, we had. 999 fantastic shows and one maybe a little dodgy yeah but this this takes the price of the worst show in 25 <laughs> years with me at least <laughs> Funny. <laughs> nice thanks for that um very quickly if you've got we've got another five minutes yeah yeah don't no, worry oh, cool cool I, i'm gonna do a, a quick fire round so I, i got 10 very quick questions you quickly okay. give me one word answers um just something new i'm introducing so hot right. or cold weather hot day or night time daytime sweet or savory sweet yeah, same for me guitar or bass hard one probably guitar okay nylon or wooden tip drumsticks i think i know your answer Wood. yeah i know your answer I think I know your answer for this. Bonham or Peart? Peart. Yeah, I thought so. Beatles or the Rolling Stones? <sighs> Impossible. Impossible. Maybe Rolling Stones. Okay, okay. Um, dark or milk chocolate? Milk. Okay. Red or white wine? White. Okay. Favorite time signature to play? Can answer that. Every, every time signature. Okay. <laughs> uh, every, everything. Fair enough. There you go. Um, and then I've got one one more question about Motorhead. What do you miss the most about Motorhead? The camaraderie. Yeah. The 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 fact that we uh, we've been best buds. We, as I said, when Lemmy at his funeral, I said, look, you know. Lemmy was, and and your father is, yeah, and hopefully stay still is for yeah. a long time. Yeah. But when it comes to Lemmy, I said he he was my my brother, my father, my granddad, my younger sister, <laughs> my bandmate. He was everything, you know. Yeah. And same goes for Phil, you know. He he's he can also be my little sister, you know, sometimes and. Uh, He's also my father and my my younger brother and my bandmate and my 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 you know we we the camaraderie and 
the three of us were very, very different. And that what made it work, you know, that we, we were so different and it made the wheels spin just perfect. We, we kind of, it's like a relationship. I mean, you know, I added something to these two guys and your father added something to me and Lemmy and Lemmy added something to, to me and Phil. Uh, and we were never, ever surprised really about each other we kind of knew each other in in and out you know and uh we never fought with under the belt it was a lot of arguments a lot of fighting a lot of disagreement but we fought and argued in a very honorable way i'd say you know and i know phil your father he he doesn't like arguments too much, you know. He yeah. was very, uh, he was. I don't think he still is because it feels like he's running his own ship now, which is great. But he, he had a little bit of a problem getting into these arguments with with Lemmy. He, he rather backed off and, and really did not want to take that fight. Okay. But me, myself, I thought that was very, very important, you know, that someone stood up. Because it was not Lemmy's way. It was our way. And that's what made us great, you know. And I know that Lemmy deep inside wanted us to, to, uh, Lemmy wanted us to, to be that way, to take the step ahead, to be involved, to be in charge. And, uh, as long as everybody pulled the equal strength forward, then everybody was agreeing on everything. And we, and we did the same hard work together and so much fun and miserable days we, we shared together, you know? Uh, that's what I miss, that whole family. Yeah. I lost, I lost the family when Lemmy died, you know? Yeah. L luckily, Phil is still here, but we don't play together and we don't no. see each other as much anymore. And you guys and my family and your family and and uh it was almost like a routine when we saw each other and yeah and you know there were good days and bad days but overall it's like a very very nice part of of your life that 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 you cannot get back no matter what band i play if i got the gig with rolling stones or <laughs> you know whoever Aerosmith or Guns N' Roses or Metallica or whatever big fucking band, it's never ever going to be the same as Motorhead no. because we were so unique musically, personality wise, and the way that we ran our ship. Yeah. And that I miss so much, you know, I have a new family now with Scorpions and I'm very, very, happy with that family but it's not the same at all it's just very different yeah but it has its great sides with with scorpions i really really enjoy playing with these guys and play that kind of music and be touring with them but it's different you know it's like you come into another family and it takes a few years to get into that i've been playing with the boys now for five years beginning of next year so Time is really flying, you know? Yeah, it's gone quite quickly. It's amazing, you know, but I still know that we are going to do some stuff with me and Phil together for Motorhead, you know? We, we're we going to do some Motorhead tribute stuff, and we're going to do... Uh, I wish that you, I mean, your father and me would write one more record together. That would be great, yeah. Kind of Motorhead style, but not Motorhead. Because we wrote great together, you know? Yeah, yeah. You should and, definitely uh, do that. It would have been great fun. Just as a just a fun thing to do. Uh, I asked him many, a couple of years back, but it was too early. But I was missing that so desperately. But, you know, maybe in the future, yeah. we can do something together again, you know? I hope so. That would be amazing, yeah. So I'm glad. It would have been very nice. I'm glad you like, you'd like to do that again. Um, Absolutely. You were, talking, you were talking about family. Um, do you 
have anything you'd like to say to the Motorhead Road crew who are probably having a very tough time? I know a few of them listen to my show. So yeah. Yeah. Um, any any uh, messages to those guys? Yeah, that there there will be no Christmas bonus this year. <laughs> And, and they know exactly what I mean with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. okay. And, and ask your dad, too, because we used to joke with him quite a lot. We, we took envelopes, and Phil put a little pick in. I put some backstage pass in or something, and, and that was the Christmas bonus. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. One yeah. year, we wrote all our autographs on a picture, and, and that was the bonus. <laughs> We gave them a lot of shit. Yeah, so. I bet. Yeah, they, I'm sure they put Sorry, up with boys. a lot. Sorry, guys. No, yeah. no Christmas bonus this year. Okay, <laughs> there you are, there, guys. Um, so yeah, but this is the last question that I ask to all my guests. Um, if you could start your own dream band with yourself on drums, not including members of Motorhead, not including members of the Scorpions, because that wouldn't be fair. Yeah. Dead, or, dead or alive, who would be playing the other instruments? That's the hardest question of them all. I, I, I just, yeah. I cannot give you an answer to that. Okay. Be because it's, there's too many, you know, there's too many great guys that I'd like to play with. And uh, I mean, oh God, I, I'd say the day if I did a solo record, yeah. I will do a solo album. That'd be cool. But I, I always wait until... I mean, I'm so busy with Scorpions these days that I don't have the energy and I don't have the, I don't have the inspiration to do it. And I will never make a record, just throw it out there. It'll be something that I, I would like to really work on. And that day, when that day comes, what kind of mood am I in? What kind of music am I going to write? Am I going to go back to write a really inspiring technical motherfucking rush record <laughs> that i love so much or will it be a fist in your face kind of motorhead record or will it be a melodic best hit record i just don't i can't answer that and when i decided that then i have to start working with different singers or or guitar players or bass players but and will i have famous names or will I go with completely unknown guys yeah yeah the the sky is the limit here I know some bass players I love to play with that doesn't have a name and they are just insane I just love their playing and same goes with guitar players yeah and actually even some singers that I go oh my god I can't believe you you're not a rock star yet you know because they are just amazing Hmm. So there's so many different ways to go. And not until I get to that point, I can answer that question. Who would I like to play with? Because okay. there's just too many of them out there. All right. Fair enough. You're the only person who hasn't answered anything. But you sure you don't want to mention any names? Of... It doesn't have to be your only choice. Any, yeah, know, any, my particular, only any particular bass players or guitar players you can think of? No, I loved. I loved when I played with Peter Baltus. Okay. And except he was a he is a tremendous bass player. Right. Yeah. I loved his his style. I mean, I, there's so many good bass players. I would love to play with with Geddy Lee. Yeah, you know? yeah. Of right. course, uh, guitar players. Uh, oh my God. I, I love Steve Lukather. Yeah. As Amazing. a guitar player. Amazing. Yeah, and he's such a good friend, and he's just tremendous. One of my absolute favorite guitar players in the whole wild world. Yeah, and you know, there's there's so many good ones. I loved Gary Moore. I mean, I loved oh, geez, yeah. so many. It's just too many. Yeah, and, it is. You know, it is I, difficult. I, yeah, that's okay. It's just too many. <laughs> I, well, I, I can I can mention. I like to play with myself. <laughs> that's, that's more fun <laughs> yeah do you, do you play a bit of you well know, i used to play guitar on whorehouse blues do you do you yes still play a little bit or is that yeah i tap away a little bit and yeah. uh but my son marcus as you know he's he's a really good guitar player today and i mean his drum skills are just 
six, seven years ahead of me, you know. Wow, he's going to be good then. He he is. He's ready to play with anyone now. Interesting. He could, he, he could have stepped in with any band that I know. Wow. And uh, he plays bass, guitar, keyboard. He sings really well. So he's got it all. So he, he's writing a lot of music downstairs here in our, you know, so-called musical room. Nice. I don't know. You haven't seen I See if you can. Yeah. Well, when we're done, I'll take you downstairs yeah. just so you can see. Yeah, that's okay. Well, that's all I had for the the conversation. So we'll we'll call that a day for the, for that. So thanks so much, and I'm sure that all the listeners are going to love this episode. Mm-hmm.